I'm Mike, and today we are going to investigate the prevailing theory that since our eyes are on the front of our head, that we are designed to eat copious amounts of meat. I have heard this thousands of times before, and I wonder if anybody has actually looked into it, so we are going to look through the scientific literature and the archaeological record to see if this theory holds up. The idea here is that a lot of prey animals tend to have eyes on the side of their head, and a lot of predators tend to have eyes on the front of their head. Therefore, the reason that we evolved eyes on the front of our head because we are apex predators that are stone cold killers. So let's look into this smoking gun of an anatomical characteristic, starting with the official hypothesis behind it, the visual predation hypothesis. It was proposed by Matt Cartmill in 1974, and from the beginning, it is not the lion-like grandiose image that people tend to envisage. It was basically that our ancestors got our eye placement from hunting bugs. Good job. The theory essentially says that our tree-dwelling ancestors evolved forward-facing eyes to better hunt insects on tree branches. All right, that's all I needed to hear. Let's, let's go home and have a steak. No, seriously, there are so many things wrong with this, and I think a great point to start is to trace our lineage back to when this actually happened to some of the first primates. From all the way back to 55 million years ago, there was Dryomamus, which was essentially a tree-dwelling shrew. It weighed less than a pound, it was largely insectivorous, eating insects, but it was among the first of our ancestors to start eating fruit. Dryomamis, like modern-day shrews, did not have forward-facing eyes. But around the same time, there was Carpolestes, the most similar living creature today is the woolly possum. As this National Geographic article mentions, its eyes were not yet forward-facing. It is important to note that Carpolestes was not discovered until a few decades after the visual predation hypothesis came about, which is important because of its diet. From the people that discovered Carpolestes, it had very primate-like teeth that were highly specialized for eating flowers, seeds, and fruits. Spent most of his time clinging to tree branches and eating fruit rather than spotting prey or leaping for its dinner. Not exactly a mean predator. Then came Notharctus about 50 million years ago. It looked much like a modern day lemur, which is primarily frugivorous or fruit eating. It for the first time actually had binocular vision or eyes in the front of its head. And from the book Primate Evolution and Human Origins, quote, Notharctus has more crested cheek teeth indicating a primarily folivorous or leaf eating dietary adaptation. And as the book A Companion to Biological Anthropology says, probably, quote, included a relatively large amount of fruit in its diet as well. Then our ancestors' eyes converged even closer together with Aegyptopithecus 30 million years ago. Aegyptopithecus was another frugivore and was by no means a predator. It was essentially like a modern-day howler monkey, which is classified as an herbivore. To sum it up, I made a chart. Number one, a tree shrew-like insectivore that also ate some fruit and was not binocular, did not have eyes in front of its head. Number two, a woolly possum-like frugivore, still not binocular. Then to number three, a lemur-like leaf eater that also ate fruit that was binocular. And number four, an even more binocular howler monkey-like frugivore. So how well did the visual predation hypothesis hold up while well, looking at our ancestors during the period in which our eye location shifted inward? Well, not very well at all. For starters, this whole adaptation occurred in a period where we went from more insectivorous to more herbivorous. The particular change happened when we went from a frugivore to a folivore slash frugivore, so no increase in predation there. And it really starts to look bad when you realize that we were losing predatory traits left and right during this period. We lost our claws and got fingernails. We also had a dental shift in which we lost our shear-like overlapping predatory molars that, say, shrews use for insects and larger predators use to snap bone and instead ended up with those inline molars that are on top of each other that are good for plant material. And then when you add that our predatory senses, our hearing and our smell, dulled over this period as well, it does not look very good for the visual predation hypothesis, which is understandable because a lot of this information was not available to Cartmill in the 70s. 
Well then, how did our eyes actually make it to the front of our head if it wasn't for hunting? Now I'm going to introduce a couple more theories, which all fit under an umbrella theory, which in fact you can shove the visual predation hypothesis under as well, and that theory is called the primate angiosperm coevolution theory, and angiosperm is simply a seed-bearing plant like a fruit tree. This is a very general idea that simply states that a lot of adaptations we had were a result of our symbiotic relationship with fruit-bearing trees, one of which is our forward-facing eyes. So they're essentially saying that anything that happened within the trees during that time could be responsible for our adaptation, but they do go ahead and say in the American Journal of Primatology that, quote, visual predation per se is not a sufficient explanation for the visual adaptations of the earliest primates. Which brings me to the polar opposite of the visual predation hypothesis, which is that our forward-facing eyes might have just helped us eat plant foods. From this study that looked at our binocular vision and our corresponding brain developments, they say, quote, Fine-grained stereopsis, or binocular vision, is likely to be critical, critical, for the visually guided delicate manipulation of plant foods. And I'm not saying that our ancestors stopped eating insects, but if you do the caloric math, it's pretty obvious. A single ant in and around maybe one or less calories. A fruit, even uncultivated, could easily get you a hundred calories. Which one is going to help you better survive and be more of an evolutionary driver? Well, from one of the co-originators of the angiosperm co-evolution theory, quote, the earliest human ancestors were likely animals that were hunted rather than ones that were hunters. By now, it's pretty obvious I don't believe it was hunting insects that gave us forward-facing eyes. But, believe it or not, I don't think that it was delicately manipulating plant foods either. I think that forward-facing eyes are a basic need in order to function well within a forested environment. Which brings me to two more theories. One, a very popular one, the arboreal locomotion hypothesis. The idea is that because binocular vision allows you to determine depth and distance, it is very useful when jumping from tree to tree like our ancestors did. If you fall, you could get eaten, so there is a large selective pressure not to do that. The criticism of this? Squirrels. Squirrels have eyes on the side of their head and they are non-stop jumping between trees. So the theory is bunk? Not so fast. Squirrels mean nothing for two reasons. Firstly, how bad is it if a squirrel falls versus a larger animal? For a large primate, for example, to fall, there are multiple reasons that's bad. A, less opportunity for recovery when falling, and B, worse damage, possibility of breaking a bone and then getting eaten. The second reason is pretty cool and maybe the main driver of our binocular evolution, and that is the X-ray vision theory. As this study explores, binocular vision gives you the ability to see through smaller objects that a single eye could not. Just hold up your finger and look past it. You can see through it wherever it is. Your eyes create a parallax that helps you detect objects or motion through a wall of leaves, but the magnitude of this effect depends on how far apart your eyes are. Squirrel eyes are really close together. In addition, since the main benefit here is to see in a cluttered environment, it is worth noting that what might be a cluttered environment for a larger animal like us might not be a cluttered environment for a squirrel. That is illustrated by this very ridiculous image. Seriously, was the head scientist like, that's perfect, that's the perfect image. So, quote, it is only the larger animals in leafy habitats where forward-facing eyes allows them to see more of what is around them, making binocular vision pretty darn useless for a squirrel. Here's a chart showing binocular convergence, or eye closeness, and body size by the leafiness of a species habitat. If you are a mammal in a leafy environment over two pounds, you are essentially guaranteed to have a high degree of convergence, regardless of your diet. In non-leafy or open environments like the plains, this is not the case, and these are the prey animals we usually think about. To extrapolate this out, even the predators in the most open environment on Earth, the ocean, still have eyes on the side of their head. Look at dolphins, look at sharks, look at octopi, and they don't seem to have a problem tracking their prey. The paper then goes on to slam the visual predation hypothesis with, quote, The results we have seen do not tend to support the conclusion that predators have the greatest convergence. They go as far as to say that predators with eyes in the front of their head might just mainly be because they tend to utilize brush and other leafy slash cluttered areas to stalk their prey. And there's an interesting case that illustrates that it may just be being a large animal in a leafy environment that is the main driving factor in binocular vision, and that is the case of the kangaroo 
and the tree kangaroo. Your standard kangaroo is kind of similar to a deer in that it has a somewhat open environment and eyes to the side, but a tree kangaroo has a distinctly forward-facing glance. It did not become a predator, it still eats plants, in this case, fruit and foliage. So like a koala or a sloth, the tree kangaroo gets added to the list of larger animals that are non-predatory and perhaps even fully herbivorous that have binocular vision. In the end, as it is simply put in this BBC article, quote, eye placement probably evolved for different reasons in different groups of animals. Yes, cats might have forward-facing eyes to help them hunt, but we have a different history that involves more fruit and leaves. In conclusion, the key takeaway here is not only did we evolve binocular vision between two non-predatory plant-eating ancestors, but there are more compelling reasons that we evolved forward-facing vision, such as just simply the ability to see our surroundings in a cluttered, leafy environment, which was key to our survival. So the idea that our eye placement means that we are predators is complete nonsense. If you ever see anybody trying to paint themselves as a ferocious hunting lion because they have forward-facing eyes, just link them to this video. I really hope they have the attention span for it. All right, that's it for today. Let me know if there are any evolutionary insights that I missed down below in the comments. And as always, feel free to like and subscribe if you have not already. And thank you for watching. Introducing the Koala Killer, an apex predator because its eyes are on the front of its head. Hey, Koala. Huh? Yeah, you. How does it feel to be at the top of the food chain? Leaves? Yeah, leaves its prey with nothing but bones. The Koala Killer premieres at 2 a.m. on National Geographic 7. Oh.